Okay. Okay. Um, we finished whatever that day was. We'll go with Tuesday. Um, we talking about minimum wage. We looked at the different minimum wages in the different states. We saw that like 30 of them have minimum wages above seven and a quarter an hour. Um, five of them have no minimum wage whatsoever. And I forgot to, oh, what did we decide that those were islands out of the Pacific? Yeah, okay. So that's where we were the other day. Minimum wage is the lowest amount that an employer has to pay the worker. Just for a little wrap your mind around things. If you're a minimum wage worker, seven and a quarter an hour, 40 hours a week, if you're lucky, you bring home, you're making $290 a week. Of course, I'm gonna say in the name of Virginia, you're gonna take some of that off. That translates to $1,250 a month. That translates into $14,500 a year. So, not a whole lot of money. Um, the nice thing is I kind of suggested that I can't, I don't remember what the standard deductions are now, where they change them, because I haven't done my taxes yet, but I want to say for the individual, it, it, it like double. So the standard deduction might be like, it's either 12,000 for a couple or 12,000 for an individual now. And it's 12,000 for an individual, well, okay, you get all your money back. You pay the taxes. If you're a minimum wage worker, you get just about all of it back. Uh, standard deduction has been increased from six thousand three hundred fifty for singles and twelve thousand seven hundred for married couples, finally in twenty seventeen, to twelve thousand two hundred for singles and twenty four thousand four hundred for married couples, finally in twenty seventeen. So uh, another lovely answer here. Uh, the, so yeah, the, you, so you barely make it a standard deduction. So a minimum wage worker working forty hours a week. How many minimum wage workers are there in the 40 hours a week? I had no idea. Okay. I don't. Fair enough. Like, 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 like 2% of hourly paid workers. All right. Minimum wage at 40 hours a week? Basically. Okay. So then the next question is what is it at? I mean, if you're working at 29 hours a week, because if you work somebody 30 or more hours a week, then that's when Obamacare ends up triggering in, and you've got to the Affordable Health Care Act. Affordable Care Act. Uh, so seven and a quarter an hour for 29 hours, that works out to what? 7, 14, 21, that's about, I don't know, 220, I'm not doing, uh, don't have a calculator. Yes. Um, ooh, no, no, it's not even that. Okay, yeah, 210. We'll go with 210. Okay. 210 a week. That would be 800 and 60. A month, and so that's going to work out to be uh, actually one percent. One percent is actually full forty hour a week. Okay. Okay. So that will below the federal minimum wage. Cool. Uh, oh, was that, is that full time workers only, or is that everybody? It's full time. Okay, full time. Okay. Um, doesn't surprise me. But, so eight sixty times fifty is. That's what? Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So no, no, not eight sixty two hundred ten. That's the number I'm looking for. So that's eleven thousand a year. No, no, it's ten thousand five hundred a year. Ah, uh, I did the eight sixty hours. Yes, I did. Yes, yeah, so I brought it down. So. Then nowadays, in reality, a lot of the minimum wage workers are going to be part-time workers, as well did the research only about 1% of full-time workers are actually only getting the minimum wage. So, Shoot, even above minimum wage, there's still crap on the arm. Yeah, they, they, yeah, don't get me wrong, there's a bunch of people making 27 and a quarter and they're say $10 an hour. 
which still falls under the category, not a whole lot of money. But just think about $860 a month. It's kind of hard if you're going to be making a $800 a month car payment, right? Or uh, if you got to pay like, I don't know, four, five, six hundred dollars a month for rent. That then you know, you know, you got to have electricity so you can have lights to keep while you're there. You know, if you can have internet or not, cable TV or not, food or not, clothes or not, actually gas for the car that you're driving or not. The minimum wage existence ain't a very exciting life. Would you agree? Yeah. This is survival. This isn't making a living. Y'all, how many of y'all take in psychology? Most of you. Y'all remember Maslow's hierarchy? <coughs> yeah, Maslow's hierarchy. Down in the bottom is survival, and then safety. And then you get to the good stuff about affiliation, the sense of belonging, the need for achievement, and then that self-actualization. This is the stuff that makes you happy and feels good about yourself. Those would be motivational factors. Down here, the bottom two, those are those maintenance factors to maintain, to survive. Minimum wage yes. is about survival. It's if you make enough, you you are working ideally 40 hours a week. You work at 40 hours a week, make a minimum wage, you'll make enough money to get basic food, basic clothes, basic housing. Nothing about happiness. This is about survival. If you're making if you're at work 40 hours a week. Yes. If you work at 40 hours a week, minimum wage. That was the target. That's the thing. Okay. Now, let's wrap your mind around something here. How many of you started saving for retirement? <laughs> okay, so uh, so if some of you are like, well, I don't need to worry about saving for my retirement. Yeah. Is social security and that kind of stuff, things to work yourself. Okay, let's talk about people that make their social that are living off of social security. Average social security check in the United States, we will see this slightly later this semester. I don't know why I'm giving away the part right now, but the average social security check a month is less than that. It's ringing in about 950, between 950 it might be up to a thousand dollars a month. That's the average. That means half of the people get social security checks are getting less than that. Social security. Security is the word there, right? Safety survival. It ain't the social security check ain't about woo, I can retire and have live it up. No, it's about if for whatever reason you decide to voluntarily quit working, we will give you enough money to where you will keep living. If you want to enjoy that time, you need to save. Because retirement is a privilege, it's not a right. You don't have the right to retire. Show me where in the Constitution or anything said you have the right to retire. You don't. It is a privilege to retire. Because what is retirement? I make enough money. I've got enough money saved up. I don't have to work anymore. I don't have I don't want to work anymore. I don't need to work anymore. That is a choice that you make. And you need to set yourself up for the situation where you can make that choice. Just because like, well, I'm 65. Woohoo! I'm, I'm graduating. No, that is a right. I mean it's a privilege, not a right. So if you want to take advantage of that privilege, you need to do what you need to do in order to take advantage of that privilege. Because if you don't, this is a lifestyle that you're going to be leaving, barely scraping by. Think about the people that you know, your grandparents, your great grandparents, or whatever, that are living on Social Security and only living on Social Security. That's assuming that they have. That's assuming that your health is in decent shape, and assuming the Social Security program is still in existence. 40 some odd years from now when y'all did it. If they had more raised today, by then, which they need to, and I don't know why they're messing around on that, which we'll talk more about that later. That's another reason. But so, if it doesn't start saving now, is your minimum wage, uh, your social security lifestyle is the minimum wage lifestyle, and the minimum wage lifestyle doesn't go very far. Our wrap your minds around that. Start out with some getting you depressed. Okay. So, 
Some people say, well, let's raise the minimum wage. That's a good thing. So we don't have people living like that. But then there's some people that say, let's don't raise the minimum wage because when you raise the minimum wage, you cause problems. And the order I happen to do these, I started with the second book. There are some people that say, no, 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 well, you can't raise minimum wage. Don't raise minimum wage. Because if you raise minimum wage, like Will said, only 1% of the workers are actually working for minimum wage. What's going to end up happening is you're going to have to, when you raise the minimum wage, you're going to end up raising the wages on a bunch of people. Remember, I think maybe we were hiring Josie. And because I was going to hire Joe, maybe it was Matthew. Because I was going to hire Matthew, I had to use the rest of you pay raise. Yeah, because I think, you know, Matthew's been there five minutes, Josie's been there five years, and she's like, what, you're going to be paying him the same as me? So I had to give her a pay raise. So if they bumped the minimum wage up to an expensive conversation by going 10, 10 an hour, and there's a reason for that exact number, and we'll, I'm reading it the day, I'll come back to that. Yeah. Oh, oh, remember. Okay, I'll come back to it. So, everybody that was making seven and a quarter an hour is going to get bumped up to 10 10 an hour. But then, what about the people that were already making $7.50, $7.75, $8 an hour? Are they going to be satisfied? I've worked longer than you. Joe's like, I've worked longer than Matthew, and now I'm going to get paid the same as Matthew when this adjustment happens. That's up. So then Josie, so she's not a minimum wage worker, she's making eight dollars an hour, but now that's below the new minimum wage, so she's gonna have to get pay raise beyond 10, 10 an hour. The people that were making nine dollars an hour, they're gonna have to get a pay raise to like eleven or twelve. The people that were making ten dollars an hour, they're gonna have to get a pay raise to twelve fifty or thirteen dollars an hour. The people who are making eleven dollars an hour, they're gonna have to get a pay raise. So this is going to end up pushing up to everybody that's making less than like fifteen dollars an hour is going to end up with some kind of a pay raise. So they could be getting smaller the farther away from the minimum wage numbers there are, but they could, it's going to happen. So suddenly, if Will was to Google how what percentage of the population is making less than fifteen dollars an hour, then that's going to be the number of people that are going to get pay raise. I don't know if you'd be able to find that number, but just. So, yeah, 1% of the workers are actually getting minimum wage, but if you're going to raise that minimum wage, you're going to end up raising wages on, I don't know, a third of the population. And that's a crap ton of money. So, it comes to the point of, well, it's one thing that I had Matthew working for me, and I had to pay him seven and a quarter an hour, but now i got to pay him ten for what little work he does. And as poorly as he does it, with bad attitude that he brings to the table, I don't think so. So what's going to happen? Be like Matthew, you can lose your jobs. Okay, before I, I I'm going to come to this third point in a second, but let me clear the ten ten out of the way. What did we just say? Forty hours a week, seven and a quarter. Equals, what was that number? 12, 210. No. <laughs> that was at 29. 290? Yeah. Okay. So try 29 hours. Oh, excuse me. Try this. 29 hours, $10.10 an hour. $290 and change. Yeah. Okay. That's why they're giving ten dollars and ten cents an hour. You end up with a because let's face it, most minimum wage workers aren't working for they they went from forty hours a week down to twenty nine hours a week. So then this gets that minimum wage twenty nine hour worker back to making the same money that they would have been making before the Affordable Health Care Act kicked okay, us. So, so less work getting done, same amount of money. Yes, less work getting done, same amount of money. But that's why they went with ten ten. That's why that number is the one. That well, isn't that giving them more time to find the same jobs and they Well, they've already had time for the last few years. No, yeah. I'm saying if they actually push 29 hours. No, no, they they just, 40 hours. Oh, no, they've already been pushed to 29 dollars an hour. I mean, 29 hours a week. That happened several years ago when the Affordable Health Care Act passed. Then there's a lot of part-time workers that are like, we can't work you for more than 29 hours a week. But here's the third one. 
Raising minimum wage is going to help teenagers instead of the low-skilled workers that it's meant to hurt, meant to help. Because who needs this protection? It's about the point of minimum wage is for people that honestly out there trying to work for a living to take care of themselves, provide for their family, whatever, are going to be able to make enough money to do that basic safety survival that we were talking about. So it's to be protecting people like that. Not necessarily to be letting people like Jordan buy video games. Or video games. Jordan's not here tomorrow. I'm not talking about it. Mine is back in front of the state. So, yeah. So here's the thing. Because here's the thing. You can, it comes down to it. What's going to happen? We've got two people. Give me the names of two humans. Max and Michael. Okay, Max. 55 years old. Max has a, I don't know, an IQ of 55 graduated less than, less than sixth grade. Michael is 16 years old. Oh, no, let's go ahead and make him 18. You have two people. Working for you, cooking French fries. You're the manager of McDonald's. Congratulations. You have Max working for you, cooking French fries. You have Michael working for you, cooking French fries. Max has been cooking French fries for you for years. Max, that's all you do is cook French fries. Michael has only been working for you for a few weeks. You have to get rid of one of these two. Who do you get rid of? Your business manager, who do you get rid of? Why Michael? He's unexperienced. He's probably going to pay Michael more. We don't have to pay Michael more yet. He's got, they, 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 let's say, they, they're both making the same money. They're, they're both seven and a quarter an hour. Michael could potentially work a lot longer for you than Max could. Okay, work longer, but you actually said the word that I'm looking for, Bonnie. Potential. Michael can work more jobs. Yeah, Michael can work more jobs. Is Max <coughs> ever going to be able to work the registers? No. no. Is he ever going to be able to work the drive through? No. How about Michael? Yeah. There's a chance he can work the registers, chance he can drive through, chance he can become a crew leader, the store manager, that kind of thing. Michael has the potential that Max doesn't. Yeah, the human in us might say, well, yeah, okay, Max, okay, he needs a job. Michael, he's spending his money buying video games instead. You know, Michael doesn't really need a job. Max sure does. But that's not your call as a business manager. Your business manager should make the right decision for the business. Michael's potential to be beneficial to the company. Michael brings more to the table, even if nothing else in form of potential, than Max. Max is never going to be doing more than Max is already doing. Just sit there and say, well, I'm going to, sorry, we're going to get rid of all the Michaels and keep all the Maxes and that kind of stuff. That's kind of like making the same decision about, okay, well, we're going to let all the married people with kids stay home on Christmas Eve and we're going to make y'all young people work. How do y'all feel about that one? We're going to let the married people take Christmas Day off and we're going to make y'all singles work. Y'all think that's much crap, right? Okay, say it's like, okay, that's more money. You're assuming we get combat pay for working on Christmas Day. But the rest of you are like, okay. <laughs> but for the rest of you, it's like a plan. Oh, why is it, who, who's to say that the quality of their life is any better or more, or more important than yours? Just as they got kids, they need to be home at Christmas if you don't? How's that fair? Is it? No. Is that maybe a form of discrimination? Uh, yeah. So you don't, you make a call on who is going to be working Christmas Day. You do that fairly. Not, but well, we're going to let the kid, people with kids off first, and then we'll let married people off second, and then we'll, if we got any more, we can let, let a couple of y'all singles take them. No. 
you come up with some kind of thing based on what we're doing seniority or we're doing a rotation you were off last Christmas so you got to work this Christmas and somebody else will be off you got to do it fairly <laughs> you don't look at the people you look at as far as their outside of work situation in making an inside of work decision it says borderline discrimination there. You're not supposed to look at outside the work things like the gender of the person, the age of the person, the race of the person, the national origin of the person, the disabilities of the person. When you're hiring people, promoting people, doing all of that kind of stuff, you have a flashback, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, we talked about this in the human resources yeah. class a couple weeks ago. Yeah, you have a flashback, too. Yeah. So, and so determining who's going to get on vacation and who's going to work a holiday, you're not supposed to be looking at that outside stuff. It's discrimination. It's just funny you mentioned that because my grocery manager, Food Line, the reason why he got a promotion to grocery manager was because he has a disability in his legs where, with like, anytime it gets extremely cold, I don't know what the actual problem is. He doesn't go to the doctor for it because um, he wasn't making enough money to. Uh, um, so they gave him a promotion, and he's actually making more than a manager that's hired over him. And he does less work than he's ever done. And it's only because of his disability. It's only because he gave it to him. That? So they could have transferred somebody in and didn't. Yeah, and that's somebody that could have got transferred in and sued the company for discrimination. Yeah. Because if he's not the most qualified person, he shouldn't have gotten a promotion. Well, another reason why is because he has 40 years of experience, but that doesn't change the fact that he's a crap well, worker. He doesn't that, work. What the experience helps factor into the are they qualified or not? That for whoever didn't get that promotion, yeah. you know, I mean, you don't need to probably get in trouble for that. I mean, you need a manager that has experience. Yeah, you also need a manager that actually did work. <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't do anything. He doesn't. He doesn't do any physical work. He, he doesn't do any computer work because he's an older guy. If we have a class one, re a class one recall means it has to be pulled for fifteen minutes because someone is done. And he doesn't check the computers. If there's a recall, someone's going to die. And that's on him. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Girl, it's complicated. <laughs> you you got to make the right choice. And the right choice, as much as it might from the humanity's point of view, you're going to be like, what? If we let go of Max, which is going to come to the next slide, if we let Max go, he's going to have less money to spend on food and clothes and rent. Where if we let Michael go, he's going to have less money to spend on video games and Cheetos and Dr. Pepper. But uh, from the management point of view, that's not your call. So the best decision for the business is we keep the people that have the potential to do more. Those are the ones we keep. And the people that minimum wage is supposed to protect workers, help workers. Well, the low-skilled worker like Max is going to be the one that gets victimized here. You've got people like Max leaving their jobs. So what do we have here? The people like Max is losing your jobs, but then ooh, other people are going to lose your jobs too. Because when prices go up, we buy less, right? When the way price of labor goes up, we're going to hire less. So we're minimum wages to help workers, but what are we doing? Two of the three of these has people losing their second jobs. So let's not raise the minimum wage. That's the argument there. We actually lose jobs, and then we really help these low skilled people. And then the same thing is jobs and jobs. Circle continues to solve that. Yes, which I'm going to complete that circle here at this moment. Uh, but the other side is well, we need to raise minimum wages because, well, if we can raise minimum wage, that takes away that monopsony power when you've got situations where these companies, you know, you got to work for me, you don't work, and you know, ha ha, I'm screwing you over and I'm controlling things. Well, they don't have that much control if everybody they've got to pay good wage. It's not like when I was having y'all working in coal mines for $2 an hour. Uh-uh. I can't make y'all work for $2 an hour. I've got to give y'all a fair wage according to what the government says. That takes away some of my power and control. So all companies ultimately end up paying better as a result. 
Higher wages leads to more labor supply. Yeah, it makes there. There's some people out there that you know, we talked about this last week. You know, I'm not gonna sit at home and uh, I'm not gonna go out and look for jobs while I can get a seven and a quarter an hour, but ten dollars an hour, maybe I will turn off the TV and go look for a job. So you end up having more workers to choose from when the minimum wage goes up. But then here's the idea. Higher wages is going to lead to increased sales. What happens? When we pay people more, what are, we, what are they going to do with that money? Spend it. So you'll end up, we're going to be buying more. So that's going to do what? If we're going to buy more, we'll buy more stuff, or well, more stuff is going to get made, and if more stuff is going to get made, we need more workers to make it. So this argument is saying, well, we're going to raise minimum wages. I mean, right, by raising minimum wages, we create jobs. So one side says raising minimum wage creates jobs. The other side says raising minimum wage costs jobs. What's the answer? It's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. Um, okay, we'll do, got this work one. Um, we're going to cut, we'll do it here and then I'll come back to this last. Um, you're going to get job, more jobs in some areas and you're going to get less jobs in some areas. People like, will lose their jobs. People like Max will lose their jobs. So what's going to happen? When people like Max lose their jobs, then be Businesses that Max buys from is going to have less sales, and so there may be jo more job loss in those categories. So, because people like Max are losing their job, there's less demand for food, less demand for clothes, that kind of stuff. So, what's going to happen? There's going to be job loss in the <laughs> food industry and the clothing industry. But Michael, is that his name? Michael got more money, and what's he spend his money on? Video games and Cheetos, what's he going to do when he gets more money? Buy more video games and more Cheetos, so what's going to happen? There will be jobs created making video games and making Cheetos. So you gain some jobs in some areas making the stuff that Michael buys. You can lose some jobs in areas making stuff that Max buys. So it's going to, so you gain some, you lose some. Historically, we've had minimum wage really since around 1935, and historically, every time they bump minimum wage, when the dust settles, there is no movement in jobs. There's some jobs created, some jobs lost. When the dust settles, the sheer number of jobs stays about the same. Sometimes it goes up to the spend, sometimes it goes down just to spend. Basically, any politician that's talking to you in the next couple of years before the next round of important elections comes up, and they're talking to you about minimum wage and jobs, ignore them. Because there is no real strong connection. Either way. They're just trying to say their arguments sound good, but there is no economic backing in reality. You gain some, you lose some. It's a draw in the end. So it's the whole So there's no magic way to make that happen. To well, raising minimum wage and only create jobs. Jobs, other jobs are getting lost. The only way you can do that is no, <laughs> no, it just won't happen. Raising prices will come even that one in just a second. I think on the next slide. But here's the fourth one. And here's the idea. The other idea is like, well, it's going to be okay if people get let go because, well, guess what? The businesses are like, well, crap, I've got to pay people more money. I, will, I went from having to pay Matthew seven and a quarter an hour, and I got to pay him $10 an hour. Well, the idea is, well, Matthew's going to say, Ooh, I'm going to pay $10 an hour, so this is a $10 an hour job. I'm going to work harder than I did before. And so, yeah, I'm paying him more than I was before, but he's going to be working harder than he was before. So it's okay. I was only getting seven dollars worth of work out of him before, but now since I'm paying him ten dollars an hour, I will get ten dollars worth of work out of him. He's going to step up his game because the idea is happy workers are productive workers. Not necessarily. Okay, not necessarily. Otherwise, does anybody have a problem with that? 
It's a big, huge, hairy problem with that. And we just looked at it a few minutes ago. Maslow hierarchy sort of comes here. Uh, I think I've got it on the next slide. Let me make sure before. Yes. Okay. I'll come to that in a second. Let me get this thing off the screen. Here's the thing. Matthew, I'm working you as an employee, and I'm paying you the least amount of money that I can get away with. And now, the government has passed the law. Matthew, I'm work paying you the least amount of money that I can get away with. Does that change his, his thinking in any way whatsoever? Does he like me better? No. Because what happened? Am I doing him any favors? No. I'm doing the least that I can get away with. <laughs> he's still, his situation is, he's doing the same crap work that he was before, working with the same co-worker, idiots, whatever that he's had to work with, doing the same boring, ugly, stinking job that he's doing before, and getting paid the least that his boss can get away with paying him. Is that going to motivate and inspire him to work harder or better than he was before? Yeah. Here's your analogy. You're running late, coming to class. This is one of you, I can't remember who it was the other day. Running late, <coughs> coming to class, blue lights. Soon, and you pull over. Cop gives you a ticket, or he doesn't give you a ticket. No matter what, whether you get the ticket or not, go back on the highway and you start doing speed limit. For how long? Until, until you don't see the cop anymore. Until you've gone over the hill and you've gone. Or you've seen them turn off into the next road. Once you can no longer see the cop in the rearview mirror, you're going to do what? You're going to go back to driving the way you were driving before. Because did your circumstances change? No. You, the reason why you were late still is there. You went from being late to being late. All right. Later. Yeah, now you're later. So your behavior is only going to be impacted for that couple of minutes because in reality, your circumstance didn't change. You're not going to, who's going to, has he picked you, cop comes tapping on the window and he goes, I get it, officer, I understand it. I promise I will never speed again for the rest of my life and I'm going to do that. And you actually, if any of you ever done that, how many of you can drive speed limit the whole way home this afternoon? I didn't think so. No, no, I mean, yes, just don't have the middle fingers out when you're going passing the cops. I'm just saying. But just, just, our circumstance, if our circumstances didn't change, don't change, our behaviors won't change. Get pulled over by the cop for being late. Well, you're still late, so you're going to speed once the cop is out of the rear view mirror again. Getting paid the least amount of money you can do to do a terrible job to getting paid the least amount of money you can to do a terrible job. Your circumstances didn't change. Behaviors don't change. So this one, nice idea. But those of you that took psychology, not so much. So we just canceled out this one. We just canceled out the third one on this slide, and we canceled out what was the second one on the other slide. By creating jobs. So we've got all these arguments, but suddenly, okay, they're going away. Maslow, to channel my hair, Dr. Hayes for a minute. Yeah, I'll pretend like I've got a mustache here. Uh, Maslow, he talks about job satisfaction and dissatisfaction as not being opposites. You can be satisfied and dissatisfied with the job at the same time. Because satisfaction and dissatisfaction come from two different places. Dissatisfaction is coming from the pay and benefits. How does that job answer the bottom two needs on Maslow's hierarchy? And then satisfaction comes from the, the work itself, the work situation. How does the job answer the top three categories on <coughs> the hierarchy of needs? A lot of you school teachers are dissatisfied and satisfied at the same time. They go, I love the work. I love it when I teach the kids and I see that aha moment that they get it. And the satisfaction of knowing that I'm changing lives for the better. I love it. But man, the pay sure sucks. And what, at what point does dissatisfaction turn into satisfaction? Because, well, that's, that's 
the issue here, I also have hierarchy, it's a hierarchy. You can't get this one, this one, and this one until these two boxes are checked. So it's a hard, you have a hard time worrying about making friends when you get, get you hanging out with your friends when you don't know where your next meal is coming from, right? So there's a problem there. But so the, the pay is only going to be answering the bottom, safety, survival. I've got food, I've got clothes. I'm surviving now. But pay doesn't really bring you happiness. Y'all heard that before. Money doesn't buy you happiness. It buys you things that help you forget about how miserable you are during the week, right? Poverty doesn't buy you things. If you have money, so you can have a job where you're neither dissatisfied or satisfied at the same time. That was what I had when I was working for Conceco Finance. The pay was good, but I hated the work. I couldn't complain about the paycheck. I wasn't dissatisfied with that. But the work, after a while, I was getting on my own level last year. Oh, is doing loan compliance. Oh, just so, um, so you can have, so these are two different things, answering two different things. And satisfaction, that's where your happiness, your self fulfillment, that kind of stuff, and the paycheck doesn't enter into that. I have just told Matthew, I don't respect him because I told him I'm still going to pay you the least that I can get away with paying you. I'm barely meeting the bare's minimum obligations. Ladies, if your boyfriend only gives you a half dead rose this evening, he ain't scoring any points, right? It's Valentine's Day, right? Well, he gave you a half dead rose as more than he gives you the other 364 days of the year, but right, he still, it ain't cutting it, right? He's doing just as little as he thinks he can get away with. So, job satisfaction, satisfaction, happiness, that need for achievement, need for accomplishment, need for power, need for affiliation and belonging, paychecks don't enter into that. So, raising people's paychecks don't enter enter into that because I'm Matthew still working the same dead end job, doing the same terrible work, working with the same coworkers who can't stand. We're getting the same miserable hours and the same heat. His circumstances didn't change because he got a minimum wage raise. You want to inspire any loyal, using money to inspire any loyalty out of the workers, you, using money, you have to give them more than minimum wage. To give Matthew pay raise to 10 cents an hour, I'm giving you just as little as I can get away with, that inspires nothing. But Matthew, I know I in week I should pay you ten dollars an hour, but I'm going to give you eleven. That feels good, right? If your boss comes up to you for absolutely no reason and gives you pay raise because I respect you and you're doing a good job, I respect you and you're doing a good job. That's why they give you the pay raise, not the government forced me to do it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. So that last bullet point doesn't really work very well. So if you're satisfied with your job, you're proactive. Try that again. If you're satisfied with your job, you're proactive and you avoid it if you're dissatisfied. You will do your productivity, more. yes. Yeah. If, if you if you enjoy your job, you enjoy the people you work with, you're gonna want to be there, you'll be less likely to call in sick, less likely to goof off, less likely to not do things. You'll actually be thinking about well, what are ways that I can do my job better, and so on. And you'll have a driven employee that's trying to do better. So you really want to make your employees satisfied, feel good about what's going on, feel good about their sense of, hey, if I work here, I can get promoted. Hey, if I work here, I'll get pay raises because I'll get recognition for doing the good job that I'm doing instead of being treated just like everybody else. Any of you in high school, group projects. You had the one or two people that actually did the work and then you had a couple people that did nothing. But then you all got the same grade. How many of you did that tick off? That's what happens when you do blanket minimum wage. Everybody's getting the same grade, and we haven't even looked at how well people are doing. If you want to give, you need to give recognition for the people that are doing good work, which means you have to pay attention to your workers so you know who's doing good work and who isn't doing good work, reward the good work, whether it's a pay raise, whether it's an employee of the month, their name is on a plaque on a wall. Whether it's an employee of the month and they get a front parking space in the parking lot. Even a, you're doing a good job, keep it up. Pat them on 
and had to keep on walking. That kind of stuff can carry a whole lot more weight than, well, we're just going to blindly give everybody pay raise to see what happens. <laughs> it's a whole lot cheaper. Take my human resources class and you learn a lot more about that. So, we have the idea of an efficiency weight, which says, well, wages are determined by an equilibrium. The supply of demand, the supply of labor, and the demand for labor. How many workers are there that are looking for jobs? How many jobs employers are there, are there out there looking for work? So, uh, so, you end up with the equilibrium. The idea of an efficiency wage is well, what happens if you pay a wage higher than you should? Higher than you need to. The example I think we talked about the other day was like this metaphorical high school in Alberta and then for restaurants in Alberta kind of thing. We had one of them that said, well, we're going to pay more. McDonald's, Hardee's, and Wendy's are each paying seven and a quarter an hour. We're going to pay eight dollars an hour. We're going to pay more than we should because we don't need to pay any more than any of the rest of them because everybody's going to be doing the same work. But why would, would you do that? The idea here is increased productivity because you're paying people more than you need to. That will get extra productivity because Matthew is going to be saying, well, why should I work any harder? Because, yeah, I'll get paid $10 an hour, but that's the minimum wage. So what happens if I goof off? I get fired from a minimum wage job. I can always get another minimum wage job. If everybody's paying $7 an hour, you're paying 8 those workers are going to be like, well, I don't want to screw up this job because I'll lose an $8 an hour job. The best I can do otherwise is a $7 an hour job. So I want to keep a good paying job compared to the other not good paying jobs that are left out there. So you will get increased productivity by paying higher than you should. You get increased loyalty. The workers are less likely to call in sick, less likely to goof off, less likely to steal stuff. Less likely to, ooh, I accidentally burned this thing french fries, I'm going to eat it. And you're less likely to have that, ooh, I accidentally made strawberry shake instead of chocolate shake. Well, I guess I've already drank it before it melts. Just don't need to trash me anyway. You, you, you don't have that much stuff going on. And you get first choice in the workers because everybody's going to come and interview with you first because you're paying more than everybody else. So everybody would rather work for you. So this is the idea of the efficiency wage. If you want a better, more productive workforce, offer better wages. Wait a minute. Visually, this is how much you should pay. What is it? Seven, seven and a quarter for fast food, and you're paying eight. That's a train here. There's some problems there. In reality, we talked about it the other day. McDonald's and Burger King going to be okay with you taking all the good workers and leaving them off balance? Uh, no. If they're going to adjust, they're going to raise their wages if they need it. But then you also get the thing of, well, if all the fast food places in town are now paying eight, nine, ten dollars an hour instead of seven and a quarter, well, we got to pay our workers that much more. What are we probably not going to do? Have as many workers. When you do an efficiency wage, you end up with this result. Instead of seven and a quarter and then ten workers, now at eight dollars, you're only gonna have eight workers or something like that. Just like that. Huh? Is that getting a more profit in the company? That's it. For society, not so good. But for the company, you you do that. If you can get more work out of eight people getting paid eight dollars an hour than you can getting work from ten people making seven and a quarter an hour, then yeah, you make this happen. Eight times eight is sixty-four. Seven and a quarter times ten is seventy-two fifty. So if you can get the same amount of work, score. You gotta do the math on that. Is you get this okay? But the fear is which what I talked about is you raise your wage and everybody else raises their wage so you end up with this brand new reality. So you're going to speak back to 
having the same number of good workers, the same number of bad workers as we had before. And now you're just paying them more. So, yeah, it might be good for society, but is it good for your bottom line? But, well, you went from having 10 workers to eight, so which two are you going to get rid of? Your worst two workers, so your productivity should be another third worker a little bit. Or worker as a whole. Yes. Yeah. And that's the math that you have to do. You got to realize, yep, we can offer a wage higher than we can, higher than we should, or we're potentially poking the bear, and we might not get the results that we're hoping for in the long run. You might just get a little temporary big up until everybody else does. Okay. Why do different people get paid different differently? Why do different jobs get paid differently? Because of the supply and demand for our skills is different. The demand for the example here, the demand for French fry cooks throughout the United States. I don't know, there's probably a million French fry cooks in the United States. Well, 500,000. I don't know. There's a bunch of McDonald's this is out there. But how many people are out there that have the skills and ability to actually cook French fries at McDonald's? A bunch. I promise I did not like the okay. I'm not going to say nobody else messed with it, but I can say that I did not. I mean, the roach went across the desk, but I don't know if you like it. There's no roach. Really? You seem sure. You need to go get your eyes checked, Doctor. Or just uh, seem like there was one in the middle of the floor. I don't know what he was and where he was, but I did see a dead bug somewhere on the floor just a day or two ago. Float right here, trying to marry my first. Anyway. So now, now hopefully I'm done being disgusting for today. So, yeah, there may be 500,000 french fry jobs in the United States, but there's probably, I don't know, 130 million people that are capable of doing it. Because it's dump the fries in the bag, put the basket in the thing, push a button, listen for the beat, take the basket out, push a button, listen for the beat, don't. So, there's a ton of people that can do the jobs, and we don't have to pay a whole lot. But, Ain't a bunch of people, there ain't many people that can hit baseballs like Albert Pujols. I keep back every year, I have to ask people because I mean, we don't really have the home run hitters like we used to have. Just, you know, it used to be Sammy Sosa and, and, and dude, I can't remember the other dudes, but anyway. Um, yep. Yeah, some people can throw footballs better than Tom Brady. But, no, they, with those set, set skills, it may not be that many people that do it. They, they can do it. So, all right, there are 32 teams out there that would like to have a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers. But there's only one Aaron Rodgers out there. So, when it's time for Aaron to come up for another contract, there's going to be 32 teams saying, Aaron, come play for us. We'll give you money. Aaron, come play for us. We'll give you money. And they'll offer millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. Whereas, because he's got skills, somebody like Blake Bortles doesn't have. If you don't follow football, you'll know what I'm talking about. So, so there's the demand for skills. So, yeah, there's only 32 teams that are looking for somebody like Aaron Rodgers, but there's 32 teams looking for him, and there's only one person who's got that level of skill, and that's him. Right? So, the supply and the demand for these skills is there. But of course, we're, you know, as a society, we're like, well, you know, we're paying somebody to throw a football a whole lot more than we're paying the teachers of our kids. It's going to be impacting society for generations. Yeah, how many people can you teach? A bunch, right? And what is the economic <coughs> value of a teacher to a county compared to what is the economic value of Aaron Rodgers to a football team? Having Aaron Rodgers on your team will win you extra games. We'll get you Super Bowl rings, we'll get you a whole bunch of jersey sales, and ticket sales, and hot dog sales, and beer sales, and all the games you're going to sell out, and you will make millions and millions and millions of dollars, extra dollars, having a quarterback like him on your team. Whereas the county government having a good English teacher versus an okay English teacher, not really going to see that financial difference. So it makes it harder for them to make those yeah, in the long run. Yeah, in the long run, hopefully society will, but 
the, the government's kind of looking for our to be here and now as opposed to in the future. Well, just the government, a lot of their decisions are not very forward looking. VDOT, the Department of Transportation, I know somebody who used to work with them. They have, because of people, they don't want people accusing them of overspending or anything. They have rules in place that they have to build the road for now. They've got to build the bridge for now. They can't look for the future. If they're building an overpass and they can't sit there and say, well, we're going to build this bridge long enough to go over these four lanes of road, they can't sit there and say, well, I'm Think in the next five years, we're going to make this four lane road turn into six lane road, so let's make this bridge a little bit longer so there's room for all six lanes to go underneath it. They can't do that. So, what is happening five years from now? They got to tear down that old bridge and put up a new bridge just because they're not allowed to do the little bit of extra forward thinking of future proofing the bridges and roads and stuff that they do make. Cost them even which costs even more in the long run, but they get in trouble. But look, they built this bridge, it's like super long for this road that don't nobody ever drive over. That's that's your problem. The San Antonio Bridge has global pulling capacity, lower down the water pipe. But 2030, no, no, especially not if what's your name and her old new green plan comes up. Maybe we're going to replace all of them. by 2030. We won't have cars or trucks or airplanes. Or yeah, just one of the one of the politicians that's coming up with some proposing some kind of green plans like get rid of airplanes and cars and coal and pioneers now, yeah. Oh no. No, it's like replace the airline flights with high speed trains and replace the coal and all that stuff with renewable energy. And if I see none of them want to go so, when it comes down to it, let's talk about. Give me the name of that person that you went to high school with that did not and probably will not take drug college. Just first name only. Talk. <laughs> that is a nickname of a person. Apparently. Let's talk about Taco. Taco went to school with you, Will. So, okay. So then we have Will. In quotation marks for summary. Okay. That is the guy. Let's talk about Taco right now. Right now, Taco is working 40 hours a week. So in a quarter an hour, so he's making what? $290 a week, right? Taco is making $290 a week. So he's bringing in, what was that, $14,000 a year? So I'm like, he's making $14,000 this year, $14,000 next year, $14,000 the year after that, $14,000 the year after that. Whereas Will, is, he's in college, getting an education and that kind of thing. So he's kind of got this thing of, he ain't making $14,000 a year. He's making three or four. Just enough money, he's got a small little part-time job, enough money to put money in the gas so he can gas any so he can come to school. And then he's like paying some college tuition, that kind of stuff. So every year, this year, Taco made ten million, ten thousand, ten thousand dollars more than Will. Next year, Taco's gonna make ten thousand more than Will. The year after that, Taco's gonna make ten thousand more than Will. So, ladies, if you're looking to date somebody that's gonna have some money to be taking you out on dates and all that kind of stuff, buying stuff for you, Will's not the person at the moment. Taco's the one with more money than Will. But in the long run, what's going to happen? Will is going to graduate. By the time Will is 22 or 23, Taco's going to be making like, I don't know, like $15,000 a year. And Will's going to graduate. He's going to get a job making $40,000 a year. Now, over the past four years, Taco's been making 30, 45, 60, 75 over this five year stretch where Will's like nothing, 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 40, right? But then a year after that, Taco only goes up by 15, Will goes up by 40. Taco goes up by 15, Will goes up by 40. Why are y'all in school and putting up with expenses and having a part-time job? Because y'all know that by the time y'all are like 26 or 27, yeah, you, he made extra money than you for the first few years, but then you catch up to him. And then by the time you're 26, you've passed him. And you're going to be making more money than him for the rest of of your career until you retire and he keeps at it. 
right? That's why y'all are here, right? Okay, that's one of the reasons. Assuming you retire, that's one of the reasons why you're here. And you making that sacrifice of instead of making fourteen thousand dollars working minimum wage at Burger King, you're working for you make four thousand dollars, then you give it one thousand up to the college and tuition, the books, and that kind of stuff. Y'all are making that sacrifice because y'all are taking the long view. That you, you ain't got as much money in your pocket now, but this is just a temporary speed bump and a temporary dead end job, and you don't want to blow an enjoyable, good rest of your life for if you have a little bit of extra money in your pocket right now for this temporary dead end job or cooking french fries or whatever it is that our dear friend Taco is doing. I hope I didn't get in trouble. And I hope Taco isn't going to let me down. But anyway, y'all know who Taco is. So. How big is that gap? It generally works out to be nowadays about 1.8. Which means, generally speaking, in a few years, a person, a college graduate, a, co a person with a master's degree is going to make 80% more money a year than somebody with just a high school degree. So when Taco is making 20, Will should be making around, on average, 38, 36, 36, that's enough. When Taco is making 40, Will would be making around whatever that is, 70. <coughs> well, it's kind of tough to project something like that, too, in a way, because a degree, any kind of degree, isn't worth what it used to be worth 20 years ago. Yeah, there's a lot more people going to college now. Yeah, you see that the, the gap is yeah. falling, some, and sometimes it's going up, and sometimes overall it is going. Yeah, more people are getting a college degree, but that difference still stands. Because there's more, we have more higher skills needed, more jobs that need the higher skills and care and education. So the problem is, the people that only had the bachelor's or only have a high school diploma, there's fewer and fewer and fewer jobs that they're going to be qualified to get. And what would those jobs be? More menial tasks. The working with their working with their backs instead of working with their brains. Working building houses, working cooking french fries, working digging ditches, working that kind of stuff. Making eight, ten, twelve, fifty jobs that we don't have to pay you a whole lot because it doesn't take a lot of requirements, and so we can fairly easily replace you. Whereas, and our economy is going away from those kind of jobs. Manufacturing the shop, socks and the t shirts and furniture and that kind of stuff. We're not doing as much manufacturing anymore, so we're losing more of those jobs, so on a percentage basis. Get more for these higher skill positions that we need. What happened on the seventh week? The gap is way down. Uh, energy crisis, recession, that kind of thing. And lots of us. No, that was in the sixties. Oh, that was in here. So see, we were getting high in the sixties. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But but then, uh, but we were hitting a recession here. Energy crisis. Comparatively, if you were to adjust for inflation, that remember, y'all don't remember, back a few years ago when gas went up like four dollars a gallon and we were all cussing. Well, comparatively, when you adjust for inflation, it was worse then. <laughs> Interest rates, inflation rates were all in the double digits. It would cost you 10, 12 percent to borrow money from the bank. Prices were going up like 10, 12 percent a year. But just keep in mind, on average, you're going to be making almost twice as much as the person that you went to school with and did not go off to college. Uh, so. Human capital. Capital is what? Say the one again. Come on, you remember this from last night. Tools and equipment. Remember land, labor, capital, and knowledge. Tools and equipment. Human tools and equipment. What are the tools and equipment that you bring to the, what, what, what do you have in your metaphorical toolbox? What can you do? What knowledge do you have? What skills do you have? What experience do you have? 
and the more of those tools you have in the toolbox, the more you can do, and the more you can do, the more they can pay you. Hint, hint, wink, wink. That's why you come to school. That's why you can get 1.8 times. That's why they, you, you, they, you can expect them to pay you more because you can do more. Here's my question. Why would you go through eight years worth of medical school if you're going to end up making the same money as you car sale? Okay, a couple of you read it, but I love the job, but the rest of no. If doctors and car salesmen got paid exactly the same, which job, how many of you would be, become doctors? How many of you would rather be a car salesman? All of you. You don't have the, you don't have the people going off at 2 o'clock in the morning having a life and death car sales emergency, right? You don't have to worry about malpractice in church and all that kind of stuff. People suing you because you sold them the car that you sold them. Life is a whole lot easier. So if the doctors weren't getting paid as much as the used car salesmen were, then guess what? The smart people are going to do it. The smart ones are going to become car salesmen. And then who's our doctors going to be? The people that were too dumb to become car salesmen. And I don't know about you, but if I'm going to have brain surgery or heart surgery or something, who do I want to be my doctor? Car salesman. <laughs> the person graduated. <laughs> Do I want Taco being my doctor, digging around in my brain? I want the smartest person I can find. If somebody is accusing me of something in my butt is getting on trial for murder, I want the smartest person I can find sitting beside me as a lawyer arguing my case for me, right? So we, we want the smart people to be doctors, we want smart people to be lawyers, we have to give them incentive. And so the incentives have to be there for the people to take the tools and dedicate them toward the harder professions as opposed to the easier professions because otherwise the smart ones are going to be the car salesman and I might as well just take a, if, if I need brain surgery and talk to my doctor, I might as well just take a drill and just bore it through the front of my forehead and take my own chances, right? Release the pressure. I have it in some movies, I probably like went dust and drilled it and release the pressure. Back in the 70s, and stuff. but you want smart people to be doctors. So, <coughs> flashback time again. Economically speak, even if you are the most hatefulest person on the planet, still don't discriminate because discrimination is bad for business. You hurt yourself when you discriminate. Yeah, you're hurting other people when you discriminate, but you're also hurting yourself. So even if you were the evilest fill in the blank on the planet, you still don't do it. Because if you discriminate as an employer, you start limiting the kinds of people that you're willing to hire from, or you've limited your options, so you're going to have to pay a higher wage to get those people that meet your narrower list of criteria. The example I used in the HR class when we talked about this a couple weeks ago was if I decide I only want to hire five foot tall Asian people, Four foot eleven is too short. Five foot one is too tall. I'm only going to hire five foot tall Asian people. How many five five, exactly tall. five foot tall Asian people are there in this county? It's kind of hard to find that tall anyway. I'm not going to go there, but there ain't many. So what am I going to have to do if I'm, I need to hire some five foot tall Asian people? I'm going to have to <laughs> hire people that find it. There's not many of them around here, so I'm going to have to try to get people to move or commute from Richmond to Raleigh to come and work for me. And so I'm going to have to pay them that much more to make it worth their while to say, yeah, I'll commute and work for you, or I will move down here and work for you. Because ain't nobody can commute from Raleigh or Richmond for seven and a quarter an hour, right? So if I'm discriminate, being, a dis being discriminatory in who I am choosing to hire from, then my pool of available candidates is smaller and it's going to cost me more. As a worker, if I am picky about who I am willing to work for, then I'm limiting my options, and so my paycheck is going to be smaller. If, as a worker, I say, I don't like, I don't trust white people, I don't trust African American people, I don't trust short people, I don't trust tall people, I'm only going to work for five foot tall Asian people. How many businesses in this county are run by five foot tall Asian people? Amazing one! And so I will have you go there and I've got to take whatever paycheck you're willing to pay me because that's the only choice I have, right? 
So I'm not going to get paid anywhere near as much as I could have gotten paid from anybody else. As a customer, if I discriminate, if I'm picky on who I'm willing to do business with, on who I'm willing to buy from, then I'm going to be faced with higher prices. If I say I, I'm, I don't like white people, I don't like Hispanic people, I don't like African American people, I don't like, I'm only willing to spend money buying stuff from five foot tall Asian people. How many stores in town are run by five foot tall Asian people? How many restaurants are run by five foot tall? So I've limited, and so I've limited who I can buy from. And then I've got to pay whatever prices that they're charging. So. Even if you are mean, even if you are Adolf Hitler reincarnated and doubled up, still don't discriminate because you're hurting yourself. That's setting aside all morality, and you won't bring morality in and don't discriminate because it's wrong and evil and stupid, but just don't do it. Even if not for any other reason, but where you economically, it doesn't work in any way whatsoever. With me? Okay. We're done. Um, <coughs> there she say he has some questions that you want to copy back and add it to a Denver. Yes, what were they? But that was the other day? Yeah, that's that's the black questions like the power bill black questions that how it related to black. Oh, well, that's like near the end, and we're over here near the end. So, no. Um, okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and stop here. And whatever that.